communication to the brain in an indirect manner. Is there an indirect uh, connect to the brain? Yes, it is through your enteric nervous system, which is supposed to be a very, very dynamic uh, nervous system or uh, it, billions of neurons put together in the wall of your gut. So, and main communication is through the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal pathway. So again, let us not go into too much of physiology. What I'm going to do is only skim and give you lots of messages, take home uh, things so that you can go and find out more about it. Okay. So you have the enteric system and it is going to work or it is going to connect with the brain through the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, adrenal cortex uh, axis, which is supposed to be very important for your stress and stuff like that. A small introduction to enteric nervous system. It is a web of 100 to 500 million neurons in the wall of the GI tract and you have the biggest set of neurons over there. And uh, one thing special about this is it has got its own uh, chemical coding structure function. That is why we call it the second brain or the brain within the gut. It secretes gastrointestinal hormones. It can affect the performance of the digestive system, so on and so forth. The best thing about this ENS or the enteric nervous system is that it can put away the harmful pathogens and microorganisms and allow the former, meaning your nutrients to be absorbed while keeping the latter out over there. And uh, the best thing again about this ENS is it is autonomous, meaning to say that if I am going to actually I'll, I'll go to the next slide and then come back again over here. So it is going to rely completely on the, it is autonomous, doesn't rely totally on the central nervous system. That is why we call it the second brain. Tell me how many of you all uh, many a times uh, would have, uh, oh, can't come back to the thing, is it okay? Right. Okay, many of us sometimes we, we will feel like when we are very stressed, probably when you're waiting for your results or you have something important happening in your life or you're going to, there is some message that you're waiting and that is going to be a big thing for you, change in your life. You will have the typical butterflies in the stomach or whatever. That is a totally ENS feature which really acts independently. We behave sometimes the way we do, not only because of the CNS, because of the enteric nervous system. And even if you're going to cut any communication to the brain, still it can send signals. So how can how is it possible? There must be some means of doing that. Now, when you look at the enteric uh, system as a nervous system, as what I said, it is important for blood flow, important for immunity. It also secretes hormones. There seems to be a connect with the neurodegenerative diseases, which I think I am going to skim on that. That is where the topic was, food for thought. Uh, now, what happens uh, signaling from the gut to the brain? So far, we have seen what is signaling from the brain to the gut. And we said it was the ANS, meaning the parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, and the enteric nervous system. We have this vagus nerve. Many of us would have studied in physiology. It is a 10th cranial nerve. It starts from your medulla oblongata and goes down to the uh, gut over there. It is supposed to be the longest uh, nerve and that is why we call it the vagus nerve, meaning vagabond or wandering nerve. If you look at the vagus nerve, it's got both the afferent and the efferent uh, nerve fibers over there. And the afferent is those are the ones that go to the brain and efferent are the ones which come from the brain or whatever. So 80% is afferent. So what are we inferring from here? That lots of messages are traveling from your gut to the brain. There's only 20% that is coming from the brain to your gut. And that is why I said the ENS is mostly autonomous. Okay. And uh, as what I said, it carries an extensive range of signals from the digestive organ to the brain and vice versa also because you are both afferent and efferent. And uh, if you look at the, as what I said, it starts from your medulla oblongata as in the brain stem, goes through the neck, touches your thorax. So it's going to, it's going to innovate your heart also and come down to the abdomen. That is why it is called the wanderer nerve over there. If you look uh, at the vagus nerve, this is the main thing that connects your gut and brain. And it gives us a lot of understanding between the diet and disease, especially psychiatric disease. Okay, why psychiatric disease? What is the reason to choose that? As I move through, 
I'm going to uh, uh, walk you through the session and uh, tell you why I particularly selected this aspect of the gut-brain axis. Now, this is when your microbiome comes in. A lot of us hear about this, the human microbiome. Everybody is talking about it. Everybody is talking about probiotics. Everybody is talking about prebiotics. So let us go find out what's so special about this human microbiome. If you look at that, look at the word over there. It co-evolved with humans, meaning to say that these bacteria are already present in your body. And it is up to us how we build this bacteria, whether we are going to have a very harmonious relationship with them or it is going to be otherwise, which is 90% decided by the kind of food that we have. Again, this is a picture I found, this wonderful picture where there is a communication between the gut-brain communication. Probably most of you all know it also, even if it is like that, let us think of this as a kind of reiteration or reinforcement because there's so much at stake and so much of health issues at stake, I think we can relook, we can revise, we can look at it again. So this is your brain and this is your gut and you have the gut-brain connection. And this I told you is a vagus nerve with your uh, uh, autonomous nervous system, your ENS and your hypothalamus pituitary axis with the ENS very comfortably positioned in the center, like a swing in between two things. And we also have circulation also. Through the circulation, we have the endocrine pathway. Endocrine, the pathway is only blood, right? It cannot travel as it wishes. It makes the hormone in one area and it sends it out through other areas. So, and you have neural pathways also and immune pathway also, quite a bit actually. So, this is a reference that I have quoted. Now, I said this word microbiome, right? So, let us go find out what is this microbiome. So, microbiome is defined as the genomes of microbes, Aprina, all your bacteria, bacteriophage, your fungi, protozoa, whatever is there, everything that lives inside and on the human body. Because our skin, if you look at our skin, you will find so many bacteria. And every day morning, we think that we wash ourselves, but certain bacteria live in our body, conferring so much of protection to us. So there is another word which I put up over there, microbiota. Can it be used interchangeably? No, because it is different. So what is microbiota? It's nothing but an assembly of microorganisms in a defined environment. And I felt I should mention this person, Lederberg and McRae, without history, we are nowhere. That's something that we have to remember that without history, there's nothing that we can trace back. And we, any chance we get, we should acknowledge people who have made a change, who have taught us so much so that we can have a a healthy life. So this is the person who actually emphasized the importance of microorganisms. So what is a microbiome? Microbiome is microbiota plus all the DNA, the entire manual that you have. So what is your bacteria? What is the outside made of protein? Does it contain lipid or is it polysaccharide? What is the DNA, RNA? What are the toxins? What are the signaling molecules? Everything put together. Just to make it simple for you, so you always feel we should reach out and uh, uh, everyone should be able to understand. So I put up a picture over here of robots, lots of them. Each of them have a function or maybe some of them are doing the same function, whatever it is, a set of robots. This is like your microbiota, your microorganisms, your microbes, which sit inside, outside your body in your entire system. Now, what is the microbiome? It's an instruction manual. For example, this particular, uh, this particular robot may have a different instruction manual. This might have a dis different instruction manual and how it acts and how it behaves. So that is the difference between your microbiome and your microbiota. We need to know that. And uh, this was another thing. There is a human microbiome project happening in India. It was reported in Economic Times in 2019. They are doing a lot of study uh, to find out what kind of microbes we have. And when we say microbes, I think mainly we are talking about bacteria because they are the ones who are found in large numbers on the skin, the depth of your gut and on every inch of the body. I have given the link, you can read that also. And it is a very ambitious uh, project, like they want to generate baseline information. And we are actually very late, 2005 itself, they started in Japan and 2000. Uh, 10 or 11, they have already started in US and they have gone on to other advanced programs also. 
this is probably and the government has given a lot of money for this we are waiting to find out and especially we want to find out the core microbiome of tribal populations in the sense that they don't have a modern lifestyle if you go to some pockets of certain uh, areas in india you have tribal population who have not shifted to the modern lifestyle maybe yeah. that we, yes oh, sorry maybe that will tell us a lot of things about uh, so we are hoping to find out and let us find out what are the healthy solutions now before i go to all those things i again it is a, it is a big topic like it, it's not something that we can uh, you know go very fast or whatever also so generally very common way of saying is uh, we we say good bacteria bad bacteria the reason why i put up this is on on left side from where i see as i am sitting you have the good bacteria and on the right side you have the bad bacteria i just wanted to point out to this particular uh, yeah e coli so this particular picture has got e coli in the uh, bad bacteria then i found another picture where again you had good bacteria you had bad bacteria in the good bacteria you had e coli this is just because i just i always tell my students that don't believe whatever you read whatever you read look for proper information it is so important so e coli is good or bad although i don't want to get into the debate e coli is like it's a part of us just like how our hair our eyes or whatever organs we have is a part of us e coli is a part of us but there are some strains which can be very dangerous and remember that everything should be in its right proportion too much of anything is good for nothing madri da either the same thing only so don't believe whatever you see you always refer good pdfs and good uh, uh, journals and uh, randomized control trials if you want to really understand the subject this just i wanted to show you now uh, uh, sir was telling me like uh, the nutrition week like uh, it is about the beginning or uh, that is the theme for this particular the so most of them are now concentrating on breastfeeding so to keep in with that particular thing i just wanted to tell you how the first two years of life is so important and when you say first two years of life we are including the intra uterine period also where this is the time when trillions of microbes and their genomes meaning the microbiota and the microbiome are going to assemble stabilize so whatever immunity whatever gut health you're going to have that is the period when everything is going to happen so it may play a big role in establishment and maturation of developmental pathways so we need to make use of that time we have to give our 100% to during pregnancy and during the first two years of life so i thought we just go through the first 1000 days of life which is trending everywhere so when the baby when the fetus is in the uh, mother's womb uh there will be microbial communities in the placenta in the amniotic fluid and in the meconium meconium is the first stool that the baby passes after making his or her exit uh, out of the mother's womb so the first inoculation starts over there okay and uh, the next stage is when the little one is ready to come out which we call is a parturition so when the baby is going to descend through the birth canal they are going to first time they will have a massive microbial inoculation if it is a normal delivery as we say vaginal delivery that is why they say babies delivered via cesarean section are at a disadvantage because they don't experience that beneficial microbial inoculation so this is something that we have to remember that unless there is a reason proper valid reason we should only go for normal delivery but not everything is in our hands but we are just trying to go through how that first 1000 days of life is going to put your gut into order next is during infancy postnatal stage main thing is breast milk even before that it's breast milk which is it is an elixir where you cannot find a a uh, 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 food like that anywhere in the world even if you're going to manufacture you cannot manufacture because it is so special there are so many uh, uh, antibodies there are so many uh, 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 immune modulating factors and look at the calcium you would have done all that in your nutrition through life cycle if you are a second year or a third year or a postgraduate 
and even otherwise that is supposed to be the best and not only that when a mother breastfeeds the baby she is going to take the baby really really close to the body where there is skin to skin contact where now you are transferring the microbes the friendly microbes present on the skin of the mother so this is again another thing so it is going to get transported transmitted and the microbiome is just maturing and after that what happens solid foods are introduced once solid foods are introduced the microbes will change they uh, now they are only uh, they uh, the little ones only thrive on breast milk when you start giving them other foods then you have new kinds of bacteria other kind of wonderful bacteria which are also going to grow over there and you are expanding and the maturation process is going to start so it starts from the time of the intra uterine period and goes on until the little one is 1000 days of life so nobody it, it, the, especially there are sometimes cesarean section maybe we uh, things may not be in our hands but this uh, uh, there is something like catch up you can catch up if it is a cesarean section also breastfeeding the baby immediately and holding the baby close that skin to skin contact should help and afterwards introducing solid foods now since our topic is mainly about uh, how we are going to relate and uh, the microbiome, I just thought we should talk about the neurotransmitters. I've kept it really short, actually. Serotonin. Why I put that happy emoji is over there because serotonin is a happy hormone. There's no doubt about it. It influences both mood, GI activity. And currently, based on the microbiome studies, they feel that the gut bacteria, that friendly bacteria or the good bacteria, if they are not able to uh, provide with uh, adequate amount of serotonin, it may be related to autism, depression, bipolar disorder. These are all, autism is a big, actually, it, it is a kind of a syndrome where they have a lot of deficits over there. So how did they come to find out about this? I have to tell that it is my duty. Most of the studies were done on germ-free mouse. They had animal models and they selected twins who had, you know, uh, autism or whatever. And they selected the, the twins and one of them is autistic. They picked out the autistic uh, baby. They took the fecal uh, matter and they uh, transplanted it onto the germ-free mouse. And they found out that the normal mouse developed autism-like symptoms, depression-like symptoms. So this is a big take-home message for us that your gut supplies your supplies serotonin. But again, there is another thing also. It's not only the gut bacteria. We have cells in the wall of the gut which also produces serotonin. And 95% of the body's supply of serotonin comes only from the gut. So that's a big thing over there. Dopamine. And people have found that dopamine, 50% of the dopamine in the human body is synthesized in the gut. What are all these things? Neurotransmitters. And if you go back to your physiology, you will study, you will, they make it in the uh, 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 axon. They bring it down to the synaptic vessels, keep it over there. Whenever a particular action has to be done, it will be released based on what is the impulse or the stimulus coming from outside. So 50% of the dopamine is found in the thing. And today they found that dopamine is important for, uh, uh, maybe responsible for neurological disorders like schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. GABA, GABA again is gamma amino butyric acid. It is a inhibitory neurotransmitter. Only very late people found out that the bacterial species over there, they can uh, prepare this, uh, they can synthesize this neurotransmitter by themselves. It plays a lot of role. Low GABA levels can produce anxiety, chronic stress, depression, difficulty concentrating, and memory problems. And acetylcholine, that is the most common neurotransmitter, which is very closely related to uh, uh, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease over there. Okay, I'm just keeping a check on the time. Okay. Then you have glutamate. The glutamate is supposed to be a, 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 a excitatory neurotransmitter, which is important for sending a lot of signals. Same is the case with norepinephrine, which is also important for alertness, memory, and fight and flight situation. Whenever you have a threatening situation, there are two things that you can do. One is you can run away from the situation. And if you are in a position where you cannot run away, you will fight it out. That is a normal response. And also it seems to have an impact on uh, maintaining the temperature also. 
and uh, so this has given us enough idea that there is an association between a healthy gut by microbiome and neurotransmitter levels in the host surprisingly there are a lot of factors which can cause a change in the gut microbial uh, you know composition mainly it is our dietary habits and environment and uh, not only that it's uh, microbiome and fiber this is something that i don't even have to tell you because you study in your first semester second semester macronutrients or human nutrition which tells you that all the resistant starch and the fiber that you eat which escape digestion comes to your lower gi tract to your colon and then there, there you have this uh, you know microbes are going to break it down into short chain fatty acids and they can do a lot of things for us we know that they can reduce uh, you know like uh, it can prevent uh, uh, diabetes it can prevent uh, cholesterol high cholesterol levels what we now understand is it can also reduce food intake activity and it can strengthen the blood brain barrier once the blood brain barrier which is made up of your astrocytes is protected you can prevent the uh, brain from a lot of insults so that is one thing bile acids so research has proved also that bile acids it is bidirectional the bile acids may have an impact on the microbes and the microbes also synthesize bile acids and they are very important to reduce inflammation today if we look at uh, like uh, i'm just looking for some eye contact with the okay right never mind mm. right so uh, uh, if you look today there is inflammation has become such a common thing if you if, why obesity is such a big problem for all the, it, it is a predisposing factor for diabetes it is a predisposing factor for metabolic syndrome so on and so forth why because obesity itself is a inflammatory state so inflammation is a key reason for half the problems many problems in life especially related to health so that inflammatory markers can be reduced so please understand they synthesize the bile acids and they metabolize bile acids also and there is something known as lipopolysaccharides it's a inflammatory endotoxin made by the gram negative bacteria so this is to show that how like bacteria microbiome can play against you also because we have both the good and the bad if there is a inflammatory switch that is put on for some reason that will give a chance for this lipopolysaccharide to enter into the system and cross the blood brain barrier especially if the gut becomes leaky the gut barrier should be strong should allow only whom it wishes to come inside whom it wishes to uh, leave outside i mean exit and entry is usually by the barrier and the gut's intelligence the ens will decide that but for some reason if you're going to put the inflammatory switch on the kind of food that you eat eating a very uh, a diet which is rich in trans fat or eating junk food and not taking care of the other nutrients in your diet this lps can cross over and can lead to a lot of brain disorders like severe depression dementia and schizophrenia and immunity definitely is yes. individually independently they can form a lot of immune bodies they can expand the cd4 t cells they can uh, the immunoglobulin a the t cell compartment they can really keep the immunity levels really really good and the main way they do it is by destroying the pathogens over there so that is what is important competing for the same sites now we move on to what is known as dysbiosis so we know what is a microbiome what is a microbiota and how important it is for you so if there is an imbalance in the gut microbial community then it is associated with disease which is called as dysbiosis so what does dysbiosis mean for us it's an imbalance okay because of either you are losing some valuable community members or you're gaining some uh, uh, pathogens over there so a uh, diet low in fiber a diet low in very high in fat and sugar and when i say fat i i the, the one thing that you have to understand is we can't take everything at face value and uh, like uh, when you say high fat probably you're talking about the unhealthy fat 
at the same time if there are some disease conditions like if a patient has got uh, a continuous fit we say uh, status epilepticus so such kind of uh, patients what do we do we put them on a ketogenic diet you step up the uh, carbohydrate i'm sorry fat and you reduce the carbohydrate that seems to help for those people mainly again by working on the gut so face value you have to take it a very high fat diet and along with sugar can lead to or dysbiosis look at the dysbiosis here it's very nice you have the bifidus you have the lactobacillus over here you have so many things which are not at all needed over here the entire makeup itself has changed over it so are there any other factors uh, apart from food that can have an impact antibiotics you have to be very careful with the antibiotics heavy metals pesticides social stressors that's what we keep telling whether dysbiosis is because of stress or stress causes dysbiosis when you have social stressors you don't you don't do you're not mindful you don't you're not bothered about what you eat and sometimes comfort foods are usually tasty foods or junk foods which may not do anything for you so it could be that or the first 1000 days of life is not taken care of properly or there could be a genetic component so i put a highlighter over here for the genetic component because generally we believe that genetics is about what we inherit from our parents our hair color our eye color our attitude our intelligence our creativity so on and so forth so many things that we can tell but we also inherit this particular microbiome also from our parents so it's very important the genetic component is also important and uh, this is a big uh, thing dysbiosis can lead to obesity you can write whatever you want look at that nafld nash which is your non alcoholic uh, steato hepatitis hypertension fatty liver disease so on and so forth but we will move towards neurogenerative disease and uh, the reason for me to pick up the neuro uh, generative disease is that many reasons one is that longevity has increased more and more people are living for a longer time that's a good thing because we have won over our battles with all the diseases uh, vaccines are there even this uh, uh, the current covid-19 also we we, uh, we were able to tide over to a great extent because of all the science technology research and uh, stuff like that and uh, so more people are living so older you grow people become more for neuro degenerative disease that is a main idea and second thing is there is a selfish reason because most of you all sitting across me over here listening uh, to the lecture are very young and we are totally dependent on the youth you are the present you are the future so you need to be healthy so definitely I, that is the reason for me to go and touch on this and uh, currently there are lots of uh, uh, mental health uh, illnesses which have increased emerging science has proved that depression and many things like that so i felt that this is the right uh, uh, set of uh, uh, you know people that i should be talking to that was the reason why i picked up dysbiosis and neurodegenerative disease so a few diseases that's all depression so depression is like this is very scary thing uh, 15.1% is the prevalence rate and uh, at the mildest all of us go through that when it is very mild you people feel low in spirit you're feeling very low you're not feeling happy you don't feel like doing anything that is okay if it passes off it's fine but severe depression can have a lot of implications as what i said and most youngsters commonly report this so this was reported in the 2020 article and now there is growing body of evidence that dysbiosis may cause depression again the mechanism is not clear i did go look for the mechanism the mechanism is not there but dysbiosis definitely as what i told you in the previous study when they did about serotonin and things like that they 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 took the fecal uh, matter from normal people and put it on germ free mice and the mice which was happy and running around within a matter of two days developed depression so that is the way that we are trying to link we need more evidence but still it is an emerging field over there amyotrophic lateral scler sclerosis it's called the als it's a very it's not thankfully it's not very common over here in india uh, it's a progressive it's progressive neurodegenerative disease where motor neurons are lost 
in the brain, brain stem, spinal cord, which leads to loss of voluntary skeletal muscle. Meaning to say, that is why I put up this picture over there, that they cannot walk over there, they cannot move, and that's going to happen eventually. And most of them die due to respiratory failure. But again, as what I said, this previous slide, I told you that it causes, but it is not clear. So Stephen Hawking, who lived for a very long time, was really given up for gone, but then he fought the disease. Such an intelligent person, he did live for that many years. So always remember that we cannot put everything and anything into a box. There are many things that may go out of the thing, but generally speaking, it's not a very, uh, it's a serious uh, disease. And uh, these patients with ALS, they seem to have a low diversity. Aptina, what is the meaning over there? They didn't have a large diversity. They didn't have bacteroides. They didn't have lactobacillus. They didn't have all your bifidum, nothing. It was very less diverse microbiome illa. when they compared it with healthy people. And majority of the patients had signs of intestinal inflammation. There are markers, interleukin-2, interleukin-6 or whatever. So it is reasonable to hypothesize that human microbiome is an early mediator. So that is one thing, there's a take home message, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease, now the prevalence has increased even in India. What happens is in the brain, you have this amyloid uh, plaques over there, which sit in between your neurons, blocking the uh, synaptic connections over there. It's a new neurodegenerative disease with no non-single cause. Most of the diseases, it's like a syndrome. And it's a disorder of the central nervous system characteristic of gradual cognitive uh, decline. So people found out that probably the enteric nervous system may be the first key player over there. And this aggregation of this beta amyloid or whatever may start from the enteric nervous system and progressively move to the CNS, which may be because of dysbiosis. So that is a new ever evidence emerging over there. So Mediterranean diet. So you may ask me a question, why you put up the Mediterranean diet? Are there no Indian diets? We have not done any uh, re research so far, but uh, there is uh, this particular uh, thing. Uh, so human intervention studies, I'll just come to that. So when they found out that they gave these people Mediterranean diet, it seemed to help. The progression of the disease was slower, like it was 1.5 to 3.5 years slower. And it, it people reported better uh, quality of life. So mainly we know why it is. It's because of all the fruits, vegetables. If you look at the Mediterranean diet, it's a lot of fruits, vegetables, legumes, fish and stuff like that. So human intervention studies are probably needed to Because the reach is more, we talk a lot about the Mediterranean diet. And if you look at this, we can easily fit in our diet also over there easily. We eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and plenty. And they eat a lot of whole grains and cereals. So, and of course, daily physical activity and walking. And uh, so now people feel that uh, uh, diet may play a big role. Like Mediterranean diet, Madri, healthy diets may play, play a big role in uh, trying to realign that uh, microbiota uh, gut uh, brain axis over there and multiple sclerosis is another disease which was not at all prevalent in a country like india but again we are seeing lots of prevalence and incidence it's autoimmune disease nobody knows why it happens it comes suddenly and usually it catches the young people it's a disability causing disease but now there's a lot of treatment or whatever but still the disease is there what happens is there is demyelination so there is demyelination, thereby the blood-brain barrier integrity is lost, allowing everyone and anybody to enter into the brain and causing further neuronal damage. And uh, people found out that they had microbial dysbiosis. So again, these diseases are, so this is how the normal uh, neuron looks and this is how the demyelinated neuron looks. And uh, so just to say that well, animal studies, I told you animal studies are done by taking the germ-free uh, mouse. They gave a restricted calorie diet and found that it improved. Same was the case with uh, high salt diet seemed to worsen the disease. And uh, conversely, uh, the uh, short chain fatty acids, which are produced mainly because of the fiber seem to bring about remission of the disease. And human studies were also done. They found that High sodium intake would worsen the disease and definitely vitamin D levels were changed in the gut microbiome. So this, we are linking the vitamin D and the 
gut microbiome over here. Next is schizophrenia. It's a strange, debilitating psychiatric disorder with positive symptoms in the sense they are in, in a high sometimes like delusions, hallucinations, aberrant flow of thought. Sometimes it can be negative symptoms. It's a very, it's now it's becoming a common uh, disease. Here also they feel that dysbiosis could help. They, they were not able to prove it. But what happened was when they gave them pre and probiotics, it seemed to help. And uh, again, this is the main slide for me. The reason for coming to youngsters like you, uh, uh, WHO estimates that 7.5% of Indians suffer from some mental disorder. And by the end of this year, I think it was in 2021 or 2020, 20% of India will suffer. So if there is something that we can do, we can do. And why don't we reach the brain through the gut? So that was my storyboard actually when I started. So healthful eating is something that all of you all know. Very simple. Have a balanced diet. Do healthy eating. And you don't have to calculate. You've just got to look at your plate. You will find out whether you're eating healthy or not. You have fill your half your plate with fruits and vegetables. A little bit of a, give up like a pie diagram. Give some space for your cereals. Some space for your proteins and please give some space for fats also healthy fats your brain loves fat okay it thrives on fat so if somebody says a low fat diet lesser than 15 percent of the total calories i will never agree i have never agreed and i always tell my students don't cut back on don't cut back on fat or don't treat them like a villain keep them like don't keep them like a close friend keep them like your somebody whom you can go to for in comfort. It's very important, girls. Phytochemicals. Anything that is colorful, you have all the phytochemicals. You don't have to search for them. You have your lycopene, you have your isoflavones, you have your chlorophyll, you have your beta carotene, you have your lutein. And if I allow you to name over here, you will name many more uh, things. And antioxidants. Thankfully, antioxidants and your phytochemicals go together. Keep them in your diet and don't forget your fiber. Whenever you eat your meal, whether you're a South Indian, North Indian or you come from the east or western part of India, wherever you come, see to it at least that you have two cooked vegetables sitting on your plate or one cooked vegetable and one salad or whatever. And I thought this is something that I wanted to talk about actually, uh, Paraya Sadam, which is a traditional thing. So when I started my storyboard, I had this uh, traditional food. So I wanted to come. This is what we have been doing. We forgot about this some time back. Why we forgot, I don't know. Paraya Sadam Solva. And uh, leave the rice, uh, the rice that is cooked uh, in the afternoon or whatever. You add some water, leave it overnight. The next morning it is fermented. You have, you can add anything to that and you can have, this is the typical way of having. And uh, other traditional foods are probiotics or more corumba. You can make your life interesting. There's no need for you to go and search and get a probiotic in the supermarket or whatever, unless there is some specific issue. This is for normal people. So the idea of this entire thing, exercise of talking to you is, let's not go into dysbiosis. So how do we maintain a normal microbiome is by having all these traditional foods. Either umbelin saloon, ragi. Millets, we forgot. Millets, it was a part of our life. If you look at the DNA makeup itself, we were destined to eat all these food. That is what we were eating. We changed somewhere along the line. It is okay. And now sustainability is another thing that we have to look at. So whatever you are growing, you have to sustain. It has to be sustainable. So millets grow even when there is no water. And ragi ambli is a, is a fantastic uh, a probiotic that you can take over there. And I wanted to again bring to your attention how the Tamil Nadu Health Department has commissioned a project for, I don't remember how much you can read actually. It was featured in a daily Institute of Surgical Gastroenterology, Government Stanley Medical Hospital. So it is a surgical department. So every day they are seeing cases of plenty of I, uh, IBD, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, where there is what you call it as, uh, you know, uh, uh, where uh, there are blocks in the thing, uh, in the intestine. So they might have to open up and they have to operate. They have found out that uh, can we improve the microbiome? And they have started using Paraya Sadam. Uh, you know, and the research is not, they have not they're still completed and they are reporting that they are seeing lots of improvement in the general health of patients. So next is probiotics. Probiotic, there is a definition. As nutrition students, you will be knowing that you can't call anything and everything as probiotic. 
all the, that is why I did not put all the more kolambe and all those things over here because politically we have to be right when we are teaching we have to tell what is uh, you know uh, the exact definition okay although in daily practice it doesn't work that way so probiotics in rather it is live microorganisms there should be a particular level so that they can modify they can modify the microbiota and uh, they bring about a lot of protection against physiological stress 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 pathogen antagonism and they improve that barrier function barrier function is something that as nutrition students or in the uh, department of nutrition we will understand this epithelial barrier function which is so important translocation of uh, bacteria prebiotics are when you take them in the diet you feed your you, it's it's not just about you eating it's your microbes sitting inside which are also eating that is why you need to send the right kind of food into your gut right so they are going to eat they don't steal from us after we eat we may not be able to digest a lot of things which is known as resistant starch or fiber that moves into your large colon and that colon and that becomes a food for the bacteria see how much they give, give you back in return so prebiotics are something that you give it and you're expecting Uh, the uh, the uh, short chain fatty acids to be produced which i already told you so the definition current definition for prebiotics is a substrate that is selectively utilized by host microorganisms and confer a health benefit so please say no to i didn't want to go on the negative thing i always believe that even when patient counseling you always tell patients what they can eat first if you start off with a class like tell them don't eat this don't eat that they will run away they will not come back to you again always starting on a positive note for everything in life is really good so never ever take antibiotics without a doctor's prescription even if it means going and visiting a doctor do that don't take without the prescription that can ruin the bacteria leading to dysbiosis trans fat okay this reminds me of uh, 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 mrs meera's uh, uh, article which was featured which i really liked it so much it was very much a, I, it was a reflection of what i was thinking like how the article featured about if you want to this pandemic and the sugar rush i think the next one will be right so this is trans fat which is supposed to be all of you all know what is trans fat like it is a plastic fat you want a particular texture in a food and you don't want to use butter because at the end of the day it's going to become very expensive so you choose a plastic fat for two reasons and you make them they are not good for you at all because they are in that the, the bonds are in the trans Or they are all not knocked out or whatever. These kind of fatty acids can go cause block your cell, not allowing things to move in and outside. So, uh, so uh, keep them. Try to keep away from them. And this is processed food. Again, anything that is put inside a cover, uh, inside a bag or whatever, and adding everything that shouldn't be going into the food. It's very tasty though. Processed food. This is what I was talking about. Like uh, Mira's article. a beautiful article where she had written about pandemic and the sugar rush where when we were left alone at home in the pandemic we didn't know what to do and we couldn't buy anything from outside because we were so scared and we had a lot of time also so we started baking we started making lot of and sugary foods come first to your mind right it's it's a, a learned uh, behavior and at the end of the day what happened dysbiosis maybe and people put on weight and she finished the article very nicely by saying that if you want to eat something just go buy it and eat so that you don't make this large quantity so what i'm trying to tell you is it's not as if you can lead a life today's life for youngsters without eating all these things but keep them at a bare minimum okay should not make it as a regular thing and this i think is a worst sugary beverages it doesn't do anything for your teeth it doesn't do anything for your gut because sugar is the class 1 villain for causing dysbiosis okay and you can do without this this is something and if you are the kind of person who doesn't like to drink water i always tell my pay, my students if you don't like to drink water add a small lime or add a small bit of orange or something leave it in your uh, glass uh, whatever and you drink that water but uh, please uh, this is doesn't have any value at all food additives i just pick two of them maltodextrin because it's very common it's used as a uh, you know a thickener or whatever and uh, this seems to cause gut dysbiosis and intestinal inflammation so that's why pasta when you cook you get that thickness over there especially the noodles and baked goods salad dressings all of them actually so sometimes they use quite a bit in energy and sports drinks also this is another thing polysorbate 
which seems to translocate remember i told you that epithelial uh, integrity and in one particular slide and the previous slide also had epithelial barrier function it can lead to growth of what is known as uh, uh, your uh, pathogen uh, equalized strain some of them which are very very mean very bad and cause them to translocate that can be a problem so where do you find this polysorbate 80 in ice cream frozen custard ice milk uh, sherbets and many frozen deserts and uh, uh, fecal microbial transplantation is something where it's happening all over the place for IBD inflammatory bowel disease where they take the fecal material from the uh, normal person who's got normal colon function or normal bowel function and they put them on to these people with inflammatory bowel disease and uh, it, it they are doing it uh, the Stanley especially Stanley Hospital they are doing it and it, it now they are thinking whether they should do it for cognitive deficits to improve cognitive deficits and to lessen the uh, plaque deposition in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so we have come from a stage of kidney transplantation, liver transplantation, so many transplantations. Look at the state we have come to as fecal microbial transplantation, which can be avoided to a great extent. So we should always think only of the preventive measure and not, th that is how we are supposed to think positively, what best we can do for a better future. So what is the future? Future probably we are looking at personalized dietary modulation of the gut microbiota, maybe the key, but word of caution because you're very young minds and you, you, at this stage, your brain is like a uh, like nascent oxygen or a sponge where it takes in everything. Always you have to be we are waiting. We are waiting for more studies to uh, yeah, emerge. And this particular human microbiome project that they are doing in India, we are waiting. We have to see what is there. But until such time, there is no need for you to wait for anything. You can have a healthy diet. Take a lot of probiotics. Don't have to go to the supermarket and pick up a, a supplement or whatever. You can do it in your home. And what your grandmother and what your thing, your desi, pariyasadam, ambali, ade mari, ella parts of the country you we have. Either I just restricted myself for this. And so let us work towards a good gut-brain axis and improve the crosstalk between the brain and the uh, gut and look for a, a good future. <laughs>